everybody, and welcome to Coffee Talk with Young Screenwriters. We are a resource and online community for up and coming screenwriters. And today, Adam is going to break down Amelie. Huzzah! Hello. So yeah. yeah. So John, think, and he's and he's very very brave for taking on this film. Yes, this is quite brave. Interestingly enough, so I actually have some thoughts on that. So this is a very information dense movie. And I think the reason for that is the same reason Arrested Development is information dense, is that they use the narrator to convey a huge amount of information in a very specific time, period of time. Like the narrator will tell you in a very humorous and engaging way, information about the characters and then use the contrast of that information with whatever it is they're doing. And you learn a lot of things that matter to the, about these people in a very short amount of time. And sort of you tracking all of the information is, is, a, is a lot when you're breaking down the movie, especially because the plot is very loose. It's yeah. just a lot of things happen though. It's interesting. Would you, would you, I, this is something we probably should get into after you've broken, but I'll just throw out sure. quickly. Um, you know, in, 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 in Hollywood, in the movie business, Hollywood or New York, I guess, uh, um, voiceover is thought of as a cheat. Yes. And I, and I think here it is used as a cheat, but it's used so effectively and, and with such charm and oh, whimsical, okay. you know, that it works. Well, well, this is kind of what I, what I, what I like to think about. It's like when you're using one of those quote unquote cheats, it's a cheat. <laughs> But normally, like the the use of it is conventionally a cheat, but it's used as a design principle of the movie it, consistently, and yeah. that's the difference. Like, momentum, yeah, I know, absolutely, yes, right? absolutely. But right? the but by thing. the way, they get to jam so much information in because they say this guy hates this and he hates this and he loves that, and it, and you and you go, oh, okay, and in about thirty seconds, you get a whole character development piece. Yeah, like it definitely. They decided to run with it, and that's yeah. why. You know, I think yeah. that's why it's effective because they just committed completely, and it you know it's fun and it's cute. It's, it's a very solid. cute movie. Yeah, it's absolutely um, charming. But what I was telling to John right before we went on is, I I had an experience with this movie when I watched it about 12, 13 years ago, where I I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. But I, what I loved about it was very different than what I loved about it when I just rewatched it. I loved, yeah. I loved the narrator. I loved the little witty details about life. I loved the style of the movie. And while those things are all great, what really worked for me this time was the romance, her character arc, and like the character interactions in the scene, like the actual writing with the characters, like those soft, tender moments that serve where there was no narrator were the best parts of the movie for me. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to, that I had that different experience. Um, I, yes. I saw it when it first came out. Loved it. I loved it this time. I, I think it's just remarkable. This was my first time seeing it, and I thought it was exactly. cute and fun. Cute is a little is a, is cute a little condescending? Is it, or no, is it is that a cute a, movie. It I is think that's movie. your own bias, John. <laughs> <laughs> it is condescending when somebody says like, "Oh yeah, that's cute." Mm -hmm. cute. That's cute. cute. But like. That's cute. <laughs> I do think the movie is cute, but like it has cute moments. It's I think it's charming. It's very charming. I guess charming is like the like pretentious you know, way so to say it. So <laughs> what <are> you say? <laughs> charming. You're, I was you're, saying you're, I thought she was going to take the note, and then it turns no. out she didn't. She threw the note back at me. <laughs> so so I, you want to break this thing? Break this yeah, thing. yeah. You gotta meet yourself while you have those uh, sirens, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're coming to get me. <laughs> yeah, I know. We know. We know. Um, so, like I just said before, Amelie is a very interesting film in that it really heavily uses narrator as a design principle to convey both information but also characterization of the characters. Like you get a sense of who this person is, what their past is, how they will be in the future, just from like showing the showing us the small pleasures they get in life like for example with her father she they she tell she tells us or the, he, the narrator tells us like he loves to take his toolbox take all the tools out clean out the box and then put everything back and then they show the mother his, her deep joy is taking her purse taking everything out cleaning it out and putting everything back by just showing 
those two pieces of information, you learn everything there is to know about like what their relationship was like and what the sort of common ground they have. Like little, the, the use of the narrator to convey characterization like that is is deeply charming. And it also it it kind of works to put the audience in kind of a point of, I don't want to say suspense, but like it's surprising all of these little whimsical observations of life. And that goes a long way. I mean, the movie does it so well that it kind of hides moments where like the plot is stalled. <laughs> we'll get into that in a moment. But like it, it really uses the narrator to vividly communicate the story world in kind of a way like a novel does. It's very, it's very interesting how they pulled it off. And I think part of that has to do with the fantastic acting across the board and the really unique uh, visual, visual direction from Jean-Pierre Genet. Really, also, you should check out his other films if you haven't. But let's go into this movie. So act one, we literally start with all of these little moments of happening in the city of Paris, like the, the fly that goes that lands perfectly in the road just to be run over by a car. All of these tiny little details, the, the two glasses on like a on a tablecloth dancing in the wind. And then literally uh, Amelie's conception. <laughs> and we meet her as a young girl, her parents and her her sort of childhood, which is her normal world. We meet this girl who desperately, desperately uh, <laughs> needs human connection, but she's denied it. Her father's a doctor and he, mis he misdiagnoses her as having a, uh, a very weak heart, a uh, heart condition. So he makes her, uh, makes sure her entire life uh, caught in their house. Like he, she can't go to school. She's homeschooled. She, her only friends are uh, a gold, a suicidal goldfish that they have to give up and uh, the imaginary friends that she has in her life. Um, and all of, all of, through all these scenes, we see, we we're actually, it, so this is the strength of the narrator. We're shown defining moments of how she is and how she interacts with the world rather than just being told. Like we're told, but we actually see, like for example, uh, when one of her neighbors was pulling a prank on her, telling her that she causes accidents, we see her get her revenge of, you know, sitting on the roof near the cable uh, satellite. And uh, whenever, that, when he's watching the soccer game and whenever he's, uh, an exciting play is going to happen, she unplugs it and replugs it. We sh that we're shown from the beginning that she is a girl who loves stratagems. She loves big pranks she loves secretly intervening almost from like a voyeuristic standpoint in the lives of other people and the use of the narrator is we 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 learn this we learn this about her in a very surprising way that doesn't feel expositional though it totally is expositional anyway her mother dies uh tragically when a canadian tourist jumps off of notre dame and squashes her <laughs> and her father sort of retreats more and more into sort of like grief and he doesn't really see her for who she is uh he he's kind of this really shut down guy who doesn't want to travel he doesn't want to go anywhere all he wants to do is build this little um shrine to his his uh, dead wife and as amelie grows up um <laughs> and she finally leaves home we, we establish her normal world as being one where she has to she can't connect with other people in their lives. And instead, she chooses to live in a disconnected fantasy world. She's always had one. She always tries to, to you know, play with her imaginary friends, whether it's like the crocodile or the character portraits, uh, the animal portraits in her room and house. She loves to invent fantasy and romance of story of life rather than actually participating in it. And that's her flaw. And it's really well done in this movie. I, I actually was actually surprised at how coherent and well rendered uh, her transformation character arc was. But as she's in her new apartment, she reads, she's on the news and she sees Lady Diana had just died. So it was a very interesting choice that this film really focuses on like a very, actually the Lady Diana, uh, uh, Princess Diana death is kind of like a grounding influence story. We really get a sense of time and place for the movie where instead of just sort of making this like a disconnected fantasy Paris, it's very much uh, Paris in the nine, in the nineties. Um, so she, while she reads the news that Lady Diana dies, she stumbles upon an old uh, 
box of toys from some boy who lived in the apartment 50 years earlier. And she's so taken by like these sort of nostalgic little artifacts and toys that she resolves that I'm going to find uh, whoever, uh, I'm going to find this boy and give him this box. I want to see the look on his face. So she goes through this whole adventure. And during this adventure, we meet almost all of the principal cast. We we meet um, her co-workers, uh, her friend Gina, uh, Joseph, uh, who's the jealous, horrible psycho lover who's who stalks Gina? Georgette, the hypochondriac coworker. Um, Suzanne, her boss, who, who used to be a trapeze artist. Uh, Madeline, her depressed landlady. Uh, the, this horrible grocer, and Lucian, the grocer's assistant, and Glassman, who's her neighbor, who has this uh, bone disease, who he can't go outside of the, he can't engage with the outside world, and he retreats to a life of. Uh, imagination and voyeurism, voyeurism. He spies on all the neighbors with his video camera. He, he's kind of an interesting parallel to Amelie, and they, they both grow together um, through the film. But anyway, in the sequence of uh, her trying to find who the box uh, belongs to, we meet all of these characters, and like she resolves to, she asks her landlady uh, who lived in the house before. She tells her to go to the grocer because he uh, used to live there. She and he tells her, you should talk to my mother. He go She goes to meet his mother and she gets a name. Um, I think, uh, what is the name? Dominique of Brododo. And she goes through the, sorry about my horrible pronunciation. She goes through the phone book and she looks for every uh, Dominique. She like, go and she meets a bunch of people who all have the same name and they're clearly either it's too young or it's a woman or you know they just died. And Glassman tells her, you have the wrong pronunciation. It's Toto, not Dodo, whatever. Um, and she finally finds this guy. Uh, I'll get more to the Glassman in a minute because that's a really that's probably the, one of the richest uh, relationships she has in the movie. But um, she finally tracks down this guy and she calls a, a phone a booth that he's in, that, that he's near, and he goes in and he sees the toy box and he, she sees this absolute look of the wave of the past hits him. He's suddenly taken back to the playground where the day, the horrible day he lost all of the marbles, all of like his, his, his aunt who used to like wear tops. He used to spy at her kind of creepy, but uh, all of these like little details and memories from his life. And in a sort of, haze of nostalgia he goes to this bar amelie this is very important amelie's sitting next to him in the bar but she doesn't make eye contact with him and it's almost as if she's she's she she's kind of in this voyeuristic outsider uh role but she's deeply engaged in what he's saying even though she's not engaging with him and this is key to amelie that she is, spends all her time living in the fantasy uh the romance of of her imaginary world, yet she can't actually cross over and engage with other people. She can't actually touch this person and talk to them in a mo even though she really, really is emotionally involved. You know, he talks about how, you know, life has passed him by in the bar. And he he talks about how he he's been estranged from his daughter and that this that this box has reminded him that he has to take life for now. Anyway. This totally inspires Amelie with a purpose, and this is the act one break, and she has sort of an objective. Now, the objective is kind of, if you would say there was a technical flaw with the movie, I do think her objective starts very broad before focusing in. Her initial objective is she's going to help mankind, which really means she's going to interfere in the lives of all her neighbors to make their lives better or sort of uh, enact justice as she, uh, as she does. So through all of act two, she is constantly... Uh, <laughs> interfering and designing these huge uh, sort of not pranks, but like <laughs> unprompted interventions into the people, into the lives of people around her. So her objective at this act break is to start doing that. And in act two, she starts to interfere in everybody's life. But as act two goes along, her, her objective really zeroes in on uh, Nino, who I define as the antagonist of the movie. If there is one, it's him because he is the one who is, I wouldn't say he's necessarily creating obstacles, but like he is sort of 
the force that's pushing back against her desire to continue creating fantasy worlds. He's the reality check. Her running away from him in the film is kind of the it's it's the it's kind of the glue that creates a lot of the conflict, especially in the second half, half of Act Two when she starts focusing in on trying to connect with him in her own uh, grand romance. Anyway, Act Two, lots of stuff happens. Um, we she she starts she she has this conversation with Raymond the Glassman, and we learn that he is obsessively painted repainting this Renoir painting, Luncheon's Luncheon of the Boating Party, and he has every single character in that painting except for one, the girl with the glass, and. This is a great uh, conversation that they keep coming back to of Amelie sitting next to him, um, next sitting next to, his name's Raymond, but I just want to call him Glassman because uh, that's his nickname in the movie. But the Glassman talking about what would the girl with the glass think? And it's obviously they're talking about Amelie whenever they're talking about the girl with the glass. Um, he can't quite ex uh, catch her expression. Anyway, um, as we continue, she starts to interfere in everyone's life she interferes in uh, uh with the joseph and G who's stalking gina he she tells joseph that georgette actually is the one who's really pining for him and then she tells georgette that oh can't you see he's tortured looking at you every single day you know uh, <laughs> trying to put that romance in action she uh imagines herself dying of exhaustion as a martyr like a Don Quixote character who's been murdered by the windmills of the world. Uh, she imagines her father dying early while missing an opportunity to experience life. So she uh, steals the gnome on her mother on that has her father put on her mother's altar, and she gives it to her um, flight attendant friend who travels the world and coordinates throughout the film. This is one of those things they keep coming back to. Uh, she coordinates for her flight attendant friend to send postcards of the gnome traveling to all the places her father secretly wished he could travel, but always felt like he couldn't because of Amelie's uh, heart condition and his wife's death. Uh, those photos, these little postcards with the gnome, you know, all these wonders of the world keep getting sent to him mysteriously, kind of taunting him. <laughs> and she starts to stalk. Um, uh, she she starts to see this. This is very important in early night too. She sees Nino for the first time. She sees this strange guy. He's pilfering underneath uh, uh, the, one of these like sort of photo booths where you take a picture um, of yourself and it immediately prints the photo. He, she sees this guy always like scraping for trash and discarded photos underneath the photo booth. Um, <laughs> and one day he misses his uh he, he she ch she starts stalking him as he's chasing after a guy who drops something his wallet or something and he drops this book and she sees this book of all of these sort of scrapbooked pictures of the photos in the photo booth sort of reassembled all these torn up thrown away discarded pictures and he's sort of created this uh what what uh what glassman uh comments as some family album of sort of the the people of paris all the sort of people who but always the off takes the, the photos they don't uh take with them in the day-to-day -day life so she sort of becomes enamored with this guy but not really who he is the grand romance of oh my god is there somebody else sort of like me who maybe i can connect with but she can't connect with him she can't go up and have a conversation with him that would be her inner need she has to go through all of these grand like sort of schemes and you know, like she has to do what she would do when she was eight years old and create like a grand story to engage with him on. Anyway, she, um, I, I, I recognize that some of these events are out of order because it's so intercut and they use the narrator to uh, sort of piecemeal these threads together. But um, functionally, um, she, not only does she set up uh, the Georgette and Joseph in the, in the room, not only does she uh, torture her dad with the garden gnome postcards? She also uh, sets up uh, this grand uh, sort of prank against her abusive grocer uh, who really treats his, um, his employee, Lucian, uh, really poorly just because he doesn't communicate uh, the way he does. And she <laughs> gets the key to his apartment and later on sort of starts setting up all these traps and booby traps in his routine, like taking the foot cream and placing it where his toothpaste normally would. All of these little things to mess up his routine. She also um, takes the, 
her her, her bro- heartbroken landlady who still can't get over the fact that her husband left her for some woman and died in a plane crash like 20 years ago she starts taking uh, uh she takes a story about uh this himalayan uh, plane that had all hundreds of letters that were never delivered and she takes her landlord lady's uh, letters uh, to her love letters to her husband she photocopies them scrapbooks them and u- rearranges and ages these letters using his words and handwriting to like make it seem like oh I made a terrible mistake and I secretly loved you so she could live not in the pain of the past but the pain of oh my god I I had a love that was pure because that was one of the only things that her landlady was living on to anyway um, in this photo, in this book of, uh, photos, there's, there's a man who keeps appearing in all of these scraps. And it's clear that Nino has been, uh, sort of putting special attention. Like who, who is this guy, this face that keeps appearing over and over and over and over and over again in, uh, the, the photo book it's, and Amelie and Glassman sort of pontificate is maybe he's a guy who's like afraid of like living, uh, afraid of aging. So he has to document himself in all these places, you know, um, they start Im- sort of imagining various theories and Glassman says to her while they're talking about the photo book and then the girl with the glass in the painting, uh, <laughs> he says, you know, she, you, she tried the girl in the glass, she tries to fix others. But who's going to, she's going to try to fix others' messy lives, but who's going to fix her messy life? Um, (laughs) uh, And at this point, we also introduce a failed writer who's constantly, uh, you know, being, you know, sort of lamenting that he wrote 30 books and nothing ever got made. And Amelie sort of starts reading his his, uh, poetry and reciting it and sharing it. Um, And about this time, this is near the midpoint. This is a very soft midpoint, I will say, but it, I think it is key because it's it changes. This is where Amelie's sort of focus uh, becomes more on Nino for the rest of the movie. Um, so she sees flyers on the photo booths for saying about like his missing book. And she sees this as an opportunity. And the narrator very clearly says, she's not going to call that the number on the, that's too easy. Although she does call it and it's to a porn shop. And she gets a little weirded out by that. But the midpoint is uh, functionally when she uh, she and Nino start to engage in a back and forth of kind of a scavenger hunt and grand romance. And at this point, all of her plans, all of these threads I was talking about really come together in sort of the positive way. Uh, Joseph and Giornino hook up. Uh, the grocery sabotage gets even worse. Um, Glassman, uh, Amelie made a tape of all of these sort of moments of on television that were unique and funny and interesting to Glassman for his own entertainment and sort of sort of to connect with him. Um, Amelie goes to the porn shop where Joseph works at with the book and he talks to his coworker and she's really heartened by the coworker tells uh, Amelie that Nino is the type of guy who takes photos of, of, uh, the feet imprints in cement he takes he he used to record uh strange laughter and amelie sort of gets her hopes out like oh my god maybe this is somebody like me somebody who i can connect with um and her father gets more pictures from the gnome amelie start the starts to overtly mock the uh grocer in person to protect lucian and she heightens her pranks on him even worse to the point where she kind of like gets him glued into his uh shoes um and this is the point she also actually goes through with the with the letter with the landlady. And she uncovers the mystery of the man in the picture book. She finally sees, oh my God, it's the repairman for the photo booths. And of course, there are all these torn up pictures because he has to do a test photo to make sure that it's fixed every time. So all of these like photos that Nino had like put together of the man, it was all just like, <laughs> just sort of the scraps of this repairman on his routine. And Nino finds a secret message from Amelie. Oh, yeah, sorry. They they She finally does this uh, thing where she gets Nino to meet her at this place, and she does this huge scavenger hunt where she has to, he has to follow arrows and go to one of those frozen guys who's pointing up to a, a viewfinder. She goes to the viewfinder, and Nino looks out, and he sees Amelie with his book near her motorcycle. He rushes down to the motorcycle and he sees the book with a message from Amelie 
uh, to meet her at two windmills at 4 p.m. And this is where we get to the end of Act Two. Um, there's a really great moment where he finally goes to two windmills to meet her, and she can't she can't do it. She can't connect with him. And I think there's a there's just an absolutely beautiful scene where he's having coffee, looking around, like looking for like the face of oh my god, is this the girl you know who's maybe I can connect with? And she's right behind him with glass, like a glass wall, and she's writing. When he turns around, he looks at her, he's like, this is you, isn't he? He takes the photo that she sent him. It is you. And she says, oh, no, 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 I don't know. She, in this moment, she fails. Uh, this is in the ultimate test, second act break. She, her flaw is too big. She's too deep in the fantasy world for what the narrator calls the reality check she doesn't want. She She's not ready to invite somebody else into her, into the, she's not ready to invite somebody else into her real secret world. She has to, she just not, isn't brave enough to actually connect with them. She gets cold feet. And, but she does uh, tell Gina, her coworker, to leave a little note in Nino's pocket um, and when he leaves. And sort of the all's lost moment, it's very, very uh, subtle, but it's there. I mean, she, well, she knows it's not subtle. It's short, but very powerful. As Nino leaves the, um, the four windmills, uh, that, that's the name of the uh, shop, the cheap coffee shop she works in, she literally collapses into a pool of water. Um, and being crestfallen, and it's a great image. And afterwards, she talks to Glassman, and he tells her, and he is the, her mentor, obviously, I forgot to mention that. He's the one with her inner need. He tells her, it's time for the girl with glass to take a risk. And she says, well, I've got another stratagem. And he says, she's fond of, your, the girl with the glass is fond of stratagems, <laughs> uh, but in fact, she's cowardly. And then Amelie also sees like on the TV that like, oh, the introversion will kill her life because she always, you know, she likes to project uh, her stories onto the news and television. So we see a lot of, uh, into the all or nothing moment, we see a lot of these sort of plots come together. Glassman asks Lucian if he has keys to the other apartments. Amelie calls into the photo book repairman to sort of organize another meeting where Nino can actually see who this guy was all along. And, but before Amelie can confront Nino, well, sorry, Nino sees the repairman finally. He has this moment of total catharsis, like, oh my God, that mystery that I've always been solving. Amelie gives him this huge revelation. And it's a very sweet moment. But um, before Amelie can confront Nino, he's disappeared. Um, <laughs> and at her father's house, at the shrine to his mother, the gnome finally arrives and he's standing there totally baffled. Um, Amelie, unfortunately, uh, Joseph tell first of all, he's just terrible in this movie. He's just a total shit. And I like that he doesn't end up together with anybody uh, <laughs> because he breaks up with Georgette. Um, and he tells uh, Amelie that Gina and Nino left together. Although Gina was just sort of wanted to like talk to him to make sure that he was sort of check that he was uh, okay enough to meet with Amelie. And he tells her where Amelie lives. She tells him where Amelie lives. And um, we get to this amazing scene um, where Amelie returns to her, it's a final fight, where Amelie returns to her apartment, dejected and disappointed. She tries to escape fantasy, but it doesn't work. She's she's dejected that she thinks Nino, um, you know, maybe isn't interested in her after all. And there's a great moment where he's on the other side of the door. He knocks and she knows it's him. And it's this great symbol. It's actually so symbolic and clear. Like she's not ready to open the door to share real intimacy with somebody. She's not ready to leave her inner fantasy world. She's not ready to open the door to her apartment. Um, and so that's the catastrophic failure. And after Nino leaves, because and he leaves a note for her saying, I'll be back. Glassman, she sees the tape that Glassman had made back to her. And he tells her that your bones aren't made of glass. If you let this chance go by, your heart will become as brittle as my skeleton. <laughs> um, and she's inspired by her mentor's message, you know, to go out there and live in the world, live in the moment, connect, have intimacy with somebody for real. She opens the door and there he is. She finally opens the door. It's her decisive action. And there's this really intimate, sensual scene where the, the, the music completely stops and they share a very intimate, like 90 second, like kissing scene. And she finally brings into a, him into her home and she's ready to share her secret world with another person like her. Um, but not just that, she's she's brave enough for the potential reality check of failure. And they have an intimate moment of connection and they're together. And we move towards the resolution where all of the plots of the movies wrap up. We see Amelie and Nino together. Um, 
we see the failed writer walking by and Amelie had made graffiti on the wall saying one of his quotes, without you, today's emotions would be the scuff of yesterday. And he sees like, oh my God, somebody put my writing on a wall. We go back to Dominique Brododo uh, as he shares a chicken with his grandson, Lucas. And the kid chicken is a callback to one of his simple pleasures in life is touching and taking apart a chicken with your hands. And he's finally connecting with his estranged uh, daughter and grandson. And Glassman after writing, draw, painting Renoir's painting over 30 times, he does it actually in the style, more cartoonist style of Lucian, his friend before. He'd sort of changed and been more open. He's no longer stuck. He's willing to see the world in a different way. Amelie's father finally leaves home, <laughs> leave that fucking gnome, and to travel the world on his own. And we end the movie with Amelie riding uh, Nino's bike with Nino uh, through Paris together. And then, of course, the narrator talking about like uh this guy on a bench who like realizes there are more brain there are more atoms in the u there are more uh connections in his brain than there are atoms in the universe anyway that's the movie yay great job and not and not an easy one that you're terrific i'm not impressed how you figured that out you nailed it and nailed i was kind of like glad i'm not doing this one yeah i was, I was wanting to tell my thought good on adam i wouldn't i would touch uh, also, you you picked up on pieces that I frankly didn't didn't get, but oh, I loved it, and I love the movie. It's a great movie, and like I said, I was surprised at how clear her character arc was. Like the the actual direction of the whole movie is about her bringing in somebody to a secret world. She's separated by a door. All she has to do is open the door. It's such a physical representation of what she has to do. It's very rare when a movie does that so plainly and in a way that works. It was really good. Yeah, it was good. Somebody, somebody mentioned early on, and I made a note uh, when I was watching it uh, that it felt you, you get the sense that Wes Anderson draws some inspiration from this film somewhere. Anderson predated this movie. Did he? Yeah. Did he? All oh, right. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And but it feels yeah. your mic's cutting out a little bit, Adam. Is that? Can you hear me? Yeah. But uh, it's but bad. it's got a lot of it's got some Wes Anderson feel, which I love. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Jean Pierre Genet, he his first film is very similar to this, and he did predate Wes Anderson. So I'd be surprised if there wasn't some similarity, yeah. some inspiration. Yeah, um, let's see. There was an interesting. Here we go. Sandra said, "I yeah, like I how this. I like how glass is a motif in the film. Fishbowl, glass man, girl with a glass cup, telephone booths, the cafe. It's great. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. That's it, it, Sandra, great job. I didn't, yeah, it's absolutely. This is one of those rare films where every single thing you see in the frame is important. Yeah. Yeah. The color, too. Like, it was so beautiful to look at. Um, yeah. It's yeah. Very well done. One of the things, um, go, go ahead. I'm going to ask if anybody has questions. They want to, if people can submit some questions. Um, I've got a question while we're waiting for them to. Uh, Adam, is the, I mean, I, is the inner need and the objective, are they intertwined? Is yeah, Yes, because at the end, um, yes. so, so I think her objective. So we get a lot of energy at the act one break of her being like, I'm going to fix everybody's problems. But yeah. it kind of gets muddy. This is kind of the one structural issue with the film. It's not really even an issue because it works, but her, her objective sort of morphs from I'm going to help all these people to their lives to I want to be with Nico, Nino. That's right. Yeah. And her inner need lines up clearly with I want to be with Nino, but I can't. Nino. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's, it, it works. They pull it off, but it, yeah. it's it's a it's a it's. It, it's what a I would have done. What I would have done is, I mean, I think as if I if I was rewriting this, uh, I would have placed the moment where she meets Nino and wants to be with him, at very close to the moment she decides to fix everybody's problems. Yeah, like it's a little too far. Like it was. Mm -hmm. It's a. It's just a weird timing thing. I don't even think it's a big uh, issue in and of itself. Um, it's just a timing thing. The objective of just like making other people's lives better is a difficult one to pull off. And nearly, it, nearly it impossible. Wouldn't, it yeah. wouldn't have worked if um, 
it, the movie wouldn't have worked if her objective didn't change to the more specific, I want to be with Nino. Yeah. Right. That's like, right. It, it did, the objective did change. Um, but they yeah. kind of had their cake and eat, ate it too. Like, it did work. Um, it's, yeah. If, if you were working on a screenplay like this, that would be a very, like, you'd want to make sure that you were making that choice intentionally, understanding how difficult it's going to be to make it feel like the movie is still moving forward. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And by the way, kind of on that note, uh, you, you, you hit on it, but I just want to say the ultimate test is, is so beautiful and so perfect. And it could be described uh, or I would describe it incorrectly as soft, but she gets there and all that separates them, let's go back to Sandra's point, and all that separates them is a glass. Yeah. And she can't break through it, so to speak. And, yeah. and, and it's just, he's right there, he's on the other side of the glass and that's her ultimate test and she can't go. Do you, know what, this, do you know what this film really does well? Act three. Act three is yeah. fantastic. It all comes together yeah. and it all focuses yeah. and it delivers. Yeah, That's as true. I was, yeah, go ahead, Alexi. I was saying it's, yeah, it sort of has like an unconventional structure until act three and that's what you leave with. So it, you know, you get to do the whole like kind of wandering feeling indie thing, but then at the very end you get to, have like an emotional payoff. So yeah, you get like, you get the best of both worlds. <laughs> Here was a, real quick, I wanted to pull up a comment. Here, what do you think, Adam? Was um, Amelie sincerely seeing things like the painting talking, like delusions? No, I mean, she's, the whole point is that she's choosing to live in a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. So it's her just daydreaming. Her daydreams are very vivid to her, but they are daydreams. It's like sort of the imagined romance because she's a hyper introvert who was trapped inside and she had no other friends other than the suicidal goldfish. And uh, like, you know, like I thought that was great. Also, I, my underrated scene that I did not remember was she was talking to her dad and he's like, oh, how, how, how are things? And he's like so not listening to her. She's like... Well, I had a, two abortions, and while I, when I was pregnant, I did crack. But other than that, I'm fine. And he was like, "Oh yeah, very good." <laughs> <laughs> that was and a Adam, good <laughs> and Adam, you hit on it. I'm just piggybacking on it, but um, back away. The, the 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 pool of water. Yep. I mean, it's just, you just go, you just kind of go. Well, that's genius. It's just genius. She it collapsed into a pool of water. I mean, you just go, okay, I give up. That's too good. It's, right. it's also something that would have never worked if they hadn't done everything they'd done before. Like it was, it was so in line with every other choice. Um, Here's a question. Usually the film I've, the films I've watched have many characters who don't seem to work well, that have many characters don't seem to work. What about this film made it work? I think my theory is it's because Amelie's mission was to interfere in all of their lives. Amelie is connected to every single one of those people in some way. Like she's got her hands in every pot. And we've when we also see everyone have an arc. Not everybody, but the shitty Joseph guy didn't have an arc. But like yeah. everybody had a moment at the end in a way because of her. So a lot of films with big cast ensembles, it's sort of like things running parallel to the protagonist. This movie, because she was the catalyst of change for everybody. Um, I think that's why it works. Um, they all intersect with her, don't they? Yep. As unconventional as some of the structure was, the thing that was always very clear was that she's the protagonist. So, like, like she was very, very strongly the protagonist, the one making the, the decisions, the one guiding other people and manipulating things. Like, she was always the one taking action. And I think that that's why we could meet other characters without it feeling like they were taking from her um, from her role as the protagonist. Like she was always the one who was active. And I think that's why, that's why it works. Um, I think you run into issues with having a bunch of characters if they start driving the story. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And in this film, um, 
Well, I just want to say, I mean, also opening about voiceover and and literally, I think, I think I've got in my notes at least the first ten minutes is all voiceover, and what what they do by by they they establish the the director establishes a tone and says, by the way, I'm going to make sure you know what kind of ride you're on. This is going to be a uh, uh, fantasy fairy tale, you know, whimsical. It's um, so make, make no, you know, make no mistake. That's, and, and so, but, and by the time she arrives as an adult and as Adam correctly said, I think, you know, she, then she's left her normal world. You know, she's now in a we're on board. We know we know what kind of world the director is putting us in, and and it's off and running. Also, so Adam, yeah. So a question you would get is like, if someone else wants to do voiceover, they'd say like, why does it work here? Right. So I have a great answer for that. <laughs> do you would? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> if I don't say so myself, so voiceover here is actually justified by the story in the sense of it does exactly it's setting up a fairy tale tone but amelie sees her life as a fairy tale so it's actually connected to the protagonist's inner need and flaw it's it's connected to who she is it's not just sort of like oh i want to tell a story in voiceover like if it was a different person with a different problem the voiceover might not be rel like be relevant. Like it would be whimsy for whimsy's sake. The thing is, sh the movie is about a whimsical person who's too lost in whimsy. So a whimsical style actually kind of helps solidify her point of view. It's it's connected to, to the protagonist. So yeah. and doesn't doesn't the voiceover doesn't the narrator uh, become a character that that we uh, that we rely on and we care about? I mean, I'm. You know, the narrator is taking. It took me by the hand and is taking me on this journey. He's almost so. like a voice in Amelie's head. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And another point is that what he's everything that he's saying is adding conflict. Like it's not yeah. like, I mean, sometimes he provides information about like what people like, and that's sort of like the whimsy. I think the the characterization of Amelie, but he adds a lot of conflict. Like it's not just like about her life and nothing's happening. It's like about how her life effed her up. <laughs> and, you know, like it's it's interesting. Like I loved the the scene of her crying, watching television, like imagining her, but she's, she's in a fantasy. She's imagining herself being a martyr to the world, saving all these people, but she's just going to die from exhaustion and millions of people will mourn her, you know, like, the narrator's telling us all of this stuff. It's like he's telling us thoughts from her head that are kind of like that. That's all about conflict. It's all about it's a great like, scene. It's such yeah. a great scene. Yeah. No, it's like the voiceover is part of her world, not yeah. just a tool to get information out. Yeah. 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 Also, her. I just have to say, her performance was oh. incredible. Like, it's yeah. so easy to do to overact and like be extra whimsical, but like she always felt like a real person. And that's kind of, I mean, Audrey Tatoj did an amazing job. She's amazing. Um, well, so, by the way, it, it, um, uh, the the um, production design and the costume, the wardrobe, off the charts. Off the charts. I mean, yeah. just there are times that, that I would pause the film to look at a shot or to look at her in these, those big, funny shoes she wears those big black shoes she wears. shoes i'm like why is she wearing those yeah but i know and by the way but then but they made perfect sense those did. were the shoes didn't you kind of go those are the shoes she would wear right yeah i was like that's fair but also what are you doing yeah i you know and and even when the when the when the guy when nico is sitting there and waiting for her and then this this skinny girl in a midriff shirt kind of thing comes in with tight jeans on and he's looking to think maybe this is her. She runs over to another guy. The contrast of that girl and Amelie is just so stark and so wonderful. You know, uh, I just I thought I, I thought those again the production design and the and the wardrobe. It's just extraordinary. extraordinary. Also, I loved that the color story of the film 
the uh, was like a faded photograph. It was all sepia, and it was kind of like <clears throat> it was very nostalgic in like the world, the choice of world. Like the greens were so green, like, and the way they would like sort of like make the cafe more colorful than the area around the cafe. It was just mm -hmm. interesting. It was really cool. Here's a question from Thomas. What did the creepy stalker guy serve as? A foil? Why didn't he have an arc or move on? I think it happened at a moment where it was happened. He he his relationship with Georgina fell apart at the end of Act Two, and it was kind of showing that Amelie's plans weren't always working out well. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Like that that timing happened, I think, at an important time. But I also think like it's better writing to sometimes leave some things on wrapped you know like he some sucked. people are just assholes you know like yeah. the only thing he liked was popping bubbles of paper that was yeah. the only thing he likes is popping bubbles of paper all of the all of the nuance with these characters is just just incredible so alexi can i interrupt for a second because i as i was watching the film i i uh i will say candidly it made me very anxious about my own interaction with students sometimes. So I'm just, look, bear with me for a second. I'm trying to unload this or unpack this. But um, again, I love this film. And a lot of times when I'm working with students um, uh, who are resistant to the work of understanding story and learning structure, um, there's a tug of war there. Um, and I try to be careful. I'm not sure I always am successful. Very unique sensibility, mm -hmm. uh, this storyteller director. Um, and it terrifies me sometimes to think that maybe I've squelched somebody's creativity. And yet when you look at this film, the structure is so damn good. Yeah. Even though it's off balance, that if you just went with, if you, if you just went with your gut, um, you couldn't collect this piece. You couldn't make it of a piece. And by the way, this is of a piece. I talk about that all the time, but it's of a piece. It is organic. Every, her shoes to that haircut, it's all of a piece. And one of the terrifying things about working with young writers and, and teaching is that you don't want to ever say no, stop, whatever, but, but, um, but you want to say, okay, take that sensibility, take that creativity and that imagination, which is unbelievable. I couldn't touch, I mean, never in my life could I be that creative. And, but then take that creativity and lay on top of it structure, which, which by the way, this film, if you go, and Adam did a great job, it's there. The structure is there or the damn thing wouldn't work. Um, so it's a real, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, I try to be amenable or, 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 or aware um, because I think I do, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to throw bouquets at her again, but Alexi, you know, the internet, her first script was, I thought this kid, and I'm sorry, you were a kid at the time. I was this a young kid. lady, whatever. <laughs> All right. um, uh, I, I thought, I don't know if she, she I thought, I, you correct me if I'm wrong, Alexi, Alexi, but I thought she has no idea what she stumbled into. <laughs> and, yeah. and how good, how good and authentic the story is. Um, anyway, that's, I just, I had to get that off my chest because I, it worries me sometimes that I stop, you know. But I don't think so because I think it's one of those things where first off parameters tend like, or yeah, like parameters or something tends to create better art. Like giving yourself a challenge mm -hmm. makes better art. And like, it's not like you can't break the boundaries once you know what they are. But I think the main issue is that people don't want to even acknowledge what they are. You know. Generally, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, you're right. They they go. This is you know. Look, Mr. Warren, you don't understand. I'm Picasso. I'm already. I moved past my blue period. I'm already into cubism. And I go, no, no, no. You're not into cubism. 
That's yeah. way, that's 30 years down the road. You've got to go through the rose period. you got to go through the blue period. You've got to go through, you know. Well, and usually it's like, it's not that you hear someone pitch an idea and you're like, ew, for no reason. It's usually that they pitch an idea and something's not working. And the answer typically lies in, in structure. You know, it's, so it's, and I think it's, no, I don't think you stifle anyone. I, 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 yeah, well, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but you know, I just, cause that's what you don't want to do. And anyway, well, but, and Michelle, like, thank you. That's a nice comment. Thank but you. But just to uh, talk about this, I agree with Alexi. Like you do, I think the approach you take, it does more good than harm in the <laughs> sense of, no, 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 because like, emphasizing structure over emphasizing it even like it will like help people more because at the end of the day every single movie at least that popular like conventional film uh not talking about david lynch or anything you know <laughs> yeah. uh follows certain principles like the big things are always there like in this film this film file follows the big things by the book it has yeah, it's such a clear yeah. normal world has such a clear first act break act three is so tight it wanders a little bit in act two, but like the important things are really, are really there and they communicate. And if they weren't, they wouldn't communicate. So mm -hmm. like at the end of the day, I think, you know, and also the stakes do get bigger through the film. Like as she finds a romance, she really wants the more she wants it. And the more, the more she escapes into fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so, so like the stakes do raise, she does get an objective. Like the important things are there. So I think teaching that, you know, but also I think, you know, if somebody really was like a genius who was going to like trailblaze, you wouldn't be able to stop them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. And, you know, we haven't intentionally chosen to break movies that follow structure. Like we've been selecting movies that we like and that yeah. people ask for. And somehow they all fit into the structure. I think if you were teaching like, there must be the elixir, you know, like the type of structure that's really, really prescriptive and like saying like the mentor must be this character and on page, whatever you must have like the taste of death or whatever it is. Then like, that's when you start really limiting people. But this, the stuff that we talk about here is really just like, in a way it's really organic. It's just like pinpointing what happens in story as people have been telling them for a long time and like explaining the connection between them and why it works. It's not really like an artificial thing forced on top of these stories. It's just right. That's right. yeah, it's like yeah. explaining how it flows and why it works. And yeah, it's like explaining the mechanics of it rather than putting boundaries on it. And, mo and most of us, I I'm sorry to say it, but most of us, you know, aren't going to be kind of this off the charts in terms of our creativity. I'm, maybe all of you, but not me. I mean, so by the way, in, in case you're not, I always think, you know, in just in case you're not Paul Thomas Anderson, I'm hoping to give you a foundation that you'll still be able to work. Because if you're Paul Thomas Anderson, I'll just get the fuck out of the way. But if you're not, you're going to need this this stuff. I had a young lady a couple of years ago. She pitched the story class, and, and she said, um, this girl, she she has a pet crow. And the crow gets kidnapped. And she spends the rest of the movie trying to get the crow back. And she and I'm like, I, oh, that not that pet crow story again. I've heard that a thousand times. I mean, I've never heard that story. And by the way, she nailed it. And for her, it was really for a lot of what I was doing was getting out of her way because she, she just got it. I mean, I, you, at some point I never did this, but at some point you want to say, excuse me, do you have a pet pro? I mean, what the hell's going on here? But, um, but you know, so sometimes, yeah, you have to be, uh, you want to do something really disturbing about crows. Um, they are sentient and they're able to have abstract thought. They have memory and they're able to hold grudges. So there have been like, so <laughs> so so, so there have been studies that say like yeah. crows, crows remember you and like react differently if you behaved badly towards them 10 years ago. I so, love that. so be nice to a crow. Be nice to a crow. They, they, the they remember. 
they're able to like have and Adam that. and Adam, the fact that you remember this is a little <laughs> are you part, I, are you I, part I, pro? Are you yeah? No, no, no. I spend time uh learning about things that are very useless all the time. So that gives but a lot great, of great because they are useless because they pop up in, in coffee exactly. class and we kind of go, That's right. It's already been justified. Hell is he talking about? It really um, justifies Schitt's Creek, the, the crows have eyes right. movie, you know? <laughs> crows are creepy. I don't like them. Um, okay. There you go. Anyway, let's let's skip back to... <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, did I do that? I didn't, the no. Lady Di thing. What was this? What's Michelle? What's that? Oh, hang on. This is the question. So when... Why slash when would one use specific historical references, especially like Lady Di's death in this movie? Is it to tap into the zeitgeist or merely as a reference point? To me, it seemed the latter. I couldn't really answer why. I don't know. I am. But I, I love it. It added something. Like it. Do you know what it did? It it added a sense of well, oh, we're we're in this world in this time because everything else was a fantasy. Right. Mm -hmm. And we and we kind of have we had one we had a foot in that in that world in the real world by virtue of because you know, I had forgot I hadn't seen the film since it came out and when the lady die thing popped up I went oh my god what are what are they doing and I I but I don't know it, yeah we apparently have to write a crow movie apparently crows investigate this <laughs> Jesus wait what does this say crows investigate this other crows to know what to avoid okay I did I opened up a whole can of crow I opened up can of crows. Apparently. There you go. There. That's fine. I didn't know that. Hey. Who knew? Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting note too. Lee and, and Adam should talk about. You know, they should do a crow. Yeah. No. <laughs> Merlin's point. Oh. Diana was a fairy tale oh. princess. Almost. That's interesting. That's interesting. I never oh, thought about that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This. This is a. Uh, I think it really helped the movie. I don't know. It was yeah. I don't know why it was chosen, but it worked. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I would say, like, if you're thinking about adding references like that in your script, I would just think about, like, knowing why you're doing it is the most important thing. Um, and keeping in mind that it's gonna, like, anchor you more to a time, probably, right. you know? So that's... Like, this movie would have been way worse if it was, like, set in the 60s or something. Yeah. <laughs> like there's something nice about like oh this is the 90s yeah also also it just it just nails paris so just... yeah kind of a a, oh. a very romantic vision of paris um, yeah you want to go into that you want to go into that bistro that cafe and, yeah yeah let's see um oh this is interesting yeah I also think the idea of Lady Di being a common person who fell into a royal whimsical life was kind of a mirror for Amelie and how she saw herself. And then that builds on this idea, which is that the princess death is very anti fairy tale too. And that was like one of her like jarring moments. I don't know so if I give Jean-Pierre Genet that much credit though. Like <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody tells me that was accidental. <laughs> Are we doing an English paper thing where you <laughs> overanalyze? Yeah, I mean <laughs> I don't know. So uh, um, a little fun fact about the movie that I think is very interesting is so uh, Jean-Pierre Genet is not like a good writer, like in sense of like he doesn't write dialogue. So he had a guy write all the dialogue and actually type out the script for him. But he had the idea for this movie a long time ago. Uh, but like he had a journal that he would record all these whimsical little stories and funny happenings. And he had this journal for over 10 years. And those are all the funny little moments come from that journal. That was something that was really? recommended wow. forever ago was to carry a notebook yeah. and write down funny things you overhear or see, or just like amusing things or character things that are just like, wow, that's really specific and great. Yeah. And that was always super fun and helpful. And you can now do it in your phone. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Which doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem as, I don't know. What, I, I, like the, I like the notebook. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll I, think, I wrote down so much stuff in high school that could have only happened at my high school. I'll have to share it sometime. It yeah. was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's I a, still, we're, there's a movie in your high school, by the way. You know that. Oh, I know. It's just. Oh Who said God. she hasn't written it already? <laughs> oh, my God. I have not. It's a big 
<laughs> it would be quite a a task. We'll see. It's not as whimsical as the use of a phone. Huh? Yeah. yeah, that's true. Although this film was like shot very close to the Lady Diana's actual death, like mm. came out in two thousand one. Um, mm -hmm. so it was still before like iPhones. Um, also, yeah, the movie wouldn't have worked with iPhones. Most movies wouldn't work with iPhones. That's as... why Wes Anderson <laughs> keeps Wes Anderson keeps writing period pieces because I'm convinced he he doesn't know how to write plots that have like the convenience of telephones, and that's yeah, a real the, problem. The, yeah. By the way, the 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 um, the cell phone really changed. It removed so many obstacles. Yeah, it's bad for because, you. Because the cell phone, I mean, I'm so old that I, you know, that the cell phone, when, when we start, when they start being everywhere, suddenly you couldn't, um, you didn't have the, the conflict of not being able to reach somebody. Yeah. And, it, and I, I remember just being terrified, thinking, oh shit, it's too easy now. Because you can yeah. always call them, call them up. But you can't find them, call them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so a lot of movies uh, <laughs> go out of their way to have phones like die, run out of batteries or, or break and like, at key moments. So like, okay, from here on, they actually have to go without their phone. It's funny. You, you can't unsee it. What's Kaylin? What is Kaylin's question there? I was talking about, can you pull it up? No, this is a writer in a notebook versus you carry versus taking notes in a phone. Oh yeah. So the actual like experience of physically writing in a notebook as opposed I to love, writing it. What do you say? I love that. I love the, the physical writing. No, is that just because I don't carry a notebook with me. I carry my iPhone with me, but yeah. I write in notebooks all the time. Like, but yeah. intentionally, like, like I do, I do use uh, um, what's it called? The uh, app where you just write things down. Oh yeah. yeah. The notes app. Notes app. Yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's like, it feels more like traditional writery to have like a little notebook in your pocket and you're like, Oh, hmm, I'm going to write on the subway. But, uh, but is it practical? Maybe, maybe not. There's I mean, also the there's small notebooks you can just put yeah. in your pocket. I just mean like, I'm not going to remember. <laughs> I, I, do you guys, this is, uh, this is probably a really, really, really nerdy thing, but I do, I'll admit to it. I, no. I use a highlight marker when, in, whenever I'm reading a book. You know, I started guys, the Facebooks. What? The Facebooks. Yeah, the yeah, Facebook. I own them. I mean, they're my books, but I mean, yeah, I do deface all my books I because I go through with highlighter and if I'm reading a nonfiction, then I write all in the book because it's I just it's a hist it was like a history major thing. I had to remember where I found things and stuff. So I would write in all of the if you look at my old textbooks. I have the most ridiculous stuff written in there. Also, because I was trying Wait, not to Kaylin, say. Why did Caitlin say John or a monster? <laughs> yeah, I I agree. I mean, John, that's John and Alexi. I would never ruin a pristine, beautiful book. But don't. But then you never go back and you find. I mean, I'm reading it right now. I'm reading this book, right? And it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And there's great stuff that I need to go back and mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean that's fair. That's fair. I'm not. I'm not saying you aren't. You don't have a functional. He talks uh, about bicycle thief in here. It's really amusing to me because I was like rereading. I was flipping through old textbooks that I had my freshman year when I was apparently a much more optimistic, positive person, and reading all of my notes on the margin, just like, wow, this is so wonderful, and it's it's a. Very Wait, did your did your notes? Do they have a different voice? They have a different tone of voice, or they yeah. Did. Wow. Yeah, it, it, was, it was me. That was you as a freshman. Yeah. Wow. Um, How cool. And that's what you gotta go back. I also sometimes this is again probably too nerdy, but then I transfer the notes that I've highlighted into um, a file that I keep. Wow. That's a lot of that's, dedication. That's not that nerdy, John. I mean, I also think the, the there's a negative connotation, negative in implication to the word nerdy. Um, uh, that you're yeah. that you're using. I, I don't this. I don't disagree with. I, I mean, agree I with Michelle that I d used to do this all the time. I have a bunch of really pretty notebooks that are like have like nice covers that people gift me, and then I never feel like I can write in them yeah. because they're too pretty. <laughs> this is 
So yeah, so the stationery. Well, then what do you? So you're saving the paper. I don't know. You know? Okay. Yeah, like saving it for something that feels like it would fit in the notebook. And then like if I start writing in it and I mess up a page, then I'm like, this notebook is dead to me. The whole I'm, thing. Is way, I do want to say somebody said books are precious. I agree, books are precious. I keep them all. Yeah. You know? And and my wife keeps saying, really, are we keeping all these books? And I'll go, mm, yeah. And I, have to use the, I have to use ugly notepads. So I've got like 20 of these. I yeah. have like the paper-ish, kind of like moleskin style ones, but they have like the paper covers, not the fancy covers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that works, that works for, for me. Works for By the way, I just, I do value books. I just, I can't no, I know, John, I was giving you a hard time. John, I was just giving you a hard time. No, but I they keep know. coming up in here. I know, people are so weird. I love to write in books. That's how you interact with the text. It's how you make sure you don't fall asleep. If it's a boring textbook, That's it's important. Fair. You're, you're right. You guys are right. You guys are right. I'm just saying, what I'm saying is that I'm weak and I can't <laughs> overcome that. Like, you guys are right. There's a so lot is, of that, is that your primary flaw or is it one of, I don't uh, one know. Of, we should, we have, do we have time to go really? I have many flaws you could tell many stories about, but one flaw there per you story, go. you know. I will say this is the only pen you should ever use. Oh, I hate those because the tips when they break, I don't know. What? How do you break it? How hard do you write? Do we have any more questions about this fantastic uh -huh. film? And by the way, Delicate Testament and Children oh, of, of City of Lost City of Lost Children. City of Lost Children. I th th those films are both really fantastic also. Why are they connected to this? What? He they directed, are and directed. And writer and director. director. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So wow. Delicatessen Delicatessen. is the I same. I was another Delic muffin. Please. No, Delicatessen is the same tone and presentation of um, Amelie, but um, it's a dystopian future fantasy about the guy. It actually has the same cast of Amelie. And it's about this guy, the guy who plays the shitty uh, jilted lover. He's, he's a clown who's... Uh, staying at this inn for the night, but he doesn't realize that the inn is run by cannibals. Yeah, and he falls in love with the cannibal's daughter. So all the people in the fit, all the all the people who, but there's a food shortage, so that's why people are eating each other. Uh, and all the tenant tenants in the building are like, "Oh God, we got to eat this nice clown guy." And the daughter's like, "But I love him." <laughs> I just remember uh, being like, what is this freaking movie? I was so yeah, confused. Yeah, no, it's really good. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good if you've seen Amelie before. I uh, had not. Right? I, I can't. Weird. I don't know which one I saw for. I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, poor Japanese girl saw this film visit Paris found and it didn't look like back on the plane. <laughs> Paris. I've never been to Paris. Oh, God. Just Adam, wait. It's, like, it's magic. I have not. I have not. I have not. Oh, you haven't? You guys are so young. You got a lot. By the way, that's a great thing. You haven't been to Paris. And, and when you go to Paris, you'll go, oh, oh, my goodness. This is the most beautiful city, arguably, in the world. Yeah. That, I was thinking about, like, okay, I feel like this is a tangent. But every single time, I was thinking about flying into Paris and, like, being like, wow, the Eiffel Tower isn't as big as I thought. But... It reminds me of like every time I used to fly to New York, I would be flying over Newark and I would see it and I'd be like, wow, the buildings are really big. I don't remember them being like, I felt like it was bigger, but I guess this is New York City. And then you pass Newark and you get to actual New York City and you're like, oh, <laughs> that's what it is. And it gets, it used to get me every single time. I would fly in, I'd be like, wow, look at New York. It's not quite as big as I remember, but it's still nice. And then you get out of Newark and you see actual New York City. And anyway, it's pretty impressive. It's pretty freaking impressive, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Paris is one, Paris is, I'm, I, you know, again, I'm so old, I've been, yeah. But Paris is all, as Ernest Hemingway said, you know, you'll always have Paris, you, you or, or he said, uh, I forget what he now I'm forgetting. He had a great quote about Paris because he and Fitzgerald were there together, as you probably know. But uh, Paris is always magical. You, it's just, it's magic. The whole unless, city is. unless you're from there, and then it's just okay. like another place. You know? Kaylin says, "No, actually, should, Parisian, huh?" I was saying, Kaylin said we should host workshops in other countries, but that's like your go-to, John. You're always teaching in other countries. It is my go. I mean, I'm yeah, and um, <laughs> constantly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a lucky thing. Um, but I can't, yeah. 
yeah, when you, when you get the chance, go to Paris. Uh, mm. One thought of them. Yeah, that's right, Volzac. Yeah. The fun fact uh, about John Pierre Genet, he is like a diehard Terry Gilliam fan to the point. Oh, that makes he, perfect sense. Yeah. And he, he's like kind of, I, I think he's, um, I think Amelie's better than anything Terry Gilliam's done, but Terry Gilliam is a lot more original <laughs> and talented. Um, <laughs> Just because Jean Pierre Genet, he's made some bad movies, like really bad movies. Like after Amelie, it's pretty rough. Is that really? Right? I don't know, know why. I don't know why. It's it's like it all worked here. It's just like I, I feel like before Amelie, he kept trying to do new things, and now he's just trying to redo Amelie, and it's always oh. hollow and bad. Um, that's, it's not good. That's depressing. It's very. Different. It's like this, uh, here's this for those in forced whimsy. Nothing worse than forced whimsy. Oh, for those no. of you who who do at some point get to go to Paris, I have a quick uh, uh, suggestion. And it's, it's when I was in my twenties, uh, I did this. Uh, the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, which is right across the river from Notre Dame, kind of adjacent. Uh, there's Shakespeare and Company bookstore. Which, uh, uh, it's famous. It's old. It's iconic. And um, uh, so when I was in my twenties, I think it remains true. I wandered in there first day I got there, I wandered in and George Wadsworth, Wordsworth who owned it and just died a few years ago, um, said, Oh, you're American, you know, which was kind of condescending. He was American by the way, but anyway, and he said, uh, do you have any money? And I said, uh, no, I don't. He said, you're, you're, you're a poor student. I said, yeah, yeah. Who is this fucking guy? And he said, do you need a place to stay? And I said, because I was going to crash in a pension for like, you know, dirty pension. And I said, yeah. And he said, you can stay here. And I'm like, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you got to work two hours a day. And I said, where do I stay? And he said, go upstairs. So if, all of you, please do this. When you go to Paris, you go to the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, you walk in, it's tiny, it's crammed, it's books. And then in the back, there are these stairs that go up the back and they go up to a second floor, which if you don't know, it's there, it's not, you can't find. And you go up the second floor and there are these, there are books, just bookshelves, just jammed. And then there are these little like day beds or cots or whatever. And he says, you can crash on one of those. So you'll sleep up there at night. And then he said, do you get up early? And I said, yeah, I get up early. What time? And he says, okay, you'll open. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, you'll open. And you work the first two hours every day. And somebody will come in and they'll take your place. Huh. And I said, and I can stay here for free. He said, you can stay here for free. And there was a guy on another day bed who was a, a musician. And he was singing in the, sub, in the metros at night. He was singing for, for change. And he had one of the other day beds. And there was somebody else. And we would pool our money together and buy a bottle of wine every night and just sit around and talk and drink a bottle of wine or two. And and that was my, that the only, the downside, the only reason I finally left is there was no hot water. <laughs> and so this, the shower, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on. I'll shut up after this, but I just hadn't thought about it. And so you go into this little shower stall, which was also the toilet, but that's another story. And you would, pull the chain and water would come down on you and it was fucking freezing cold. There was no hot water. So you pull it, get wet, soak down, pull it, rinse off. And just like, Oh my God, shivering. Uh, but I got to live. And so you can, you, I believe it's still shake his George's daughter now runs it. And, um, and I always go back whenever I'm there and, uh, uh, you can stay there for free and live upstairs. Um, and uh, it's it's not the most it's not the cleanest place you'll ever stay, but it's free and it's Shakespeare. And it's got a great Shakespeare company's got a great history and that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It was it was I was beside myself. I was that's beside, very was, like writer vibes. It's writer vibes and and somebody down on another bed in, in that second floor as a writer wanted wanted to be a writer and and then you spend the work those two hours the next the, the rest of the day you just walk walk Paris which is the greatest walking city in the world that's wow. awesome yeah it's pretty cool man yeah. I will go did I sh <laughs> that, that story just, oh, just everybody no, no, no it was a good story. 
Yeah. People I are just looking it up. Just yeah. looking it up. Oh, you look Shakespeare got me up. Yeah. yeah. It's a great that little yellow. Yeah. It's, it's just it's the most charming, fantastic place. And there are readings in the little place next door. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. That's cute. Should we talk about what we're gonna do next week? Yeah, what are we gonna do next week? It was one of your picks, John. A little bit of an oh. unconventional one. Yeah, free, it's kind of unconventional. Free solo. Free solo. Uh, it's a documentary. We haven't done this is our first doc, isn't it? Yeah, it's our first doc. First doc, Timmy Chen, uh, based on Alex Handel. Um, um, is it? Have many of you seen uh, Free Solo? Adam, have you seen Free Solo? I have not. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, okay, it great. Well, yeah. it's huh? <laughs> it looks stressful. Looks like a man. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything. I don't will spoil say anything. that. Don't spoil anything. Uh, yeah, just the, the character and well, yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything. It's I love this film. Uh, he won an Academy Award. Not the. It's a rock climber man, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, Lexi, Lexi has his way of like taking my balloon and just sticking a needle in it and just. <laughs> It's a rock climber, man. It's a rock. No, it's like, an see, amazing it's gift of hers. It's an amazing gift we have. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, yeah. and she yeah. does it with such subtlety that you think, and then you go, "Oh, wait, that kind of hurt. That kind of." It's cool. say, John. John. Huh? It's because you never. It's because you never watched her favorite movie, Short Term Twelve. It is. She's, I've never forgiven you. Fuck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just a side movie. note uh, to Despina. Up. Uh, can we do third man one day? We already did third man. Yeah, it's uh, old copy class. You can watch it. Yeah. Oh, Michelle, I don't buy that. I think Shakespeare wrote them all. Sorry. What did you just say, Adam? I was oh, I was reading. Uh, somebody said asked if we could do the third man, and I let them know. We, 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 we don't. We haven't done the we, third man. Why don't we've no, already we done did. the third man? Yeah, we've done the third. Man. Yeah. What are they asking? If we could do it again? What, oh, I, I think I think it's kind of thing that we did it. Was that a joke? I, oh, that was a joke on me. That's why I didn't get it. No. I don't know. Um, I don't yeah, who knows? Who I knows? love. It. Come on, the third man is great. John, what's your opinion on the anti-Stratfordians, people who believe that Shakespeare didn't write his own plays? Yeah, I know. Uh, what's his name? They they think it was. Uh, what's his name? They think it was a lot of people, but uh, yeah, but there, there's one. Grammar. No, I think. I mean, you know, I think it's Shakespeare. I mean, but also I love to, the, the idea that this guy, you know, this glove maker's son wrote these and then one day walked away you know i i i think it was shakespeare i think it's there's a lot of evidence there's a lot of circumstantial evidence uh yeah. i think all of the all of the uh arguments against it are just arguments from incredulity that show like a class bias like there's no way that this person from this it had to be a noble you know like uh, yeah when, mm. when when really it was i think the most convincing evidence is that we know that William Shakespeare was an actor working in London at the time, and he was exposed to other playwrights and other, like, why is it so crazy to believe that he wasn't, like, that wasn't an education enough, you know, um, to... Is that really what people think? I thought it was just more that people thought. I didn't know it had anything to do with, like, not believing it was possible. I thought it was more just, like... There's no real evidence that he didn't write the plays. Yeah. Right. And Harold Bloom, who, you know, if you ever want to deep dive into Shakespeare, Harold Bloom, who died last year, I think, um, is, is, was the preeminent scholar on Shakespeare. And I don't know much, you know, but, but I love Bloom. And, and he said it's Shakespeare, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's a class thing. Like, I think, I think the people who originated this are, were just like, it was like, no way somebody who wasn't from our col educated elite, you know, could produce work like that, you know. It was just a yeah. I mean, oh, interesting. Yeah, for me, it's not a class thing. It's for me. It's how could anybody be this brilliant? You know? I mean, I, you also have to think like. I mean, first of all, I am a huge Shakespeare fan. Like, I I love love with a capital L the tragedies and the sonnets and all that shit. But like, I do really much believe that it was like a human being who's like makes mistakes. Like, if you read bad Shakespeare, like. Like he he's written bad plays. Like if you look at his whole like uh, war, like his highs are so high. He has so many incredible works. But like he is a human. Like he wrote bad stuff. You know, like uh, two gentlemen. Wrote, you know, the, 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 
he wrote some bad stuff. There, yeah, there's some inferior stuff. But you know, and I don't like. I'm not a big fan of the comedies, but um, yeah, the tragedies. Romeo and Juliet. The tragedies Romeo and Juliet and the, the most over. Romeo and Juliet is the most overrated, over quoted sack of shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> But it's, it's, some but great it's moments. successful. It's, so, what, so, Adam, on this note, before we go, I don't know where we are time wise, but what's your favorite Shakespeare? Othello. Othello's the good one. I mean, okay. You know, oh, really? my story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of kisses. She swore in faith, twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She thanked me and bade me. If I had a friend that oh, loved yeah, her, I'm, I should but get him to tell my story, and that would woo her. Oh, yeah. All this stuff. Like, so I many good That's brilliant. Really, that was, I'm what? very impressed. I'm what? <laughs> I was asking oh, no. if you're in LA. In, at, in college, I had a college class where we we did the tragedies, and our uh, essay, we uh, the grade was two essays, but our exam, which was ten percent of the grade, was that we had to memorize ten speeches. Um, and I, I, re I remember those ten speeches. Uh, not ten. I remember three of them, uh, because you because the, the, the thing is the trick. Obviously, for those who don't know, um, the trick to memorizing those speeches is to understand the meeting and context. And the moment you understand like what's being said, it actually becomes pretty straightforward. Um. By the way, somebody said Marlowe. That's right, it was Marlowe who they think. Um, Macbeth, yeah, oh, King Lear Macbeth, for me. Wait, wait, King wait, Macbeth is, I, I love Macbeth, but it's just Macbeth's overexposed. I think Othello, I, Othello was like the best production I had seen. And so like, you, you like the one you've seen, like you've liked the ones you've seen done well, you know? Um, King Lear is depressing. King Lear, I love, and King Lear, King you're right. I've seen the, I've seen a couple productions that were just unbelievable, and so King Lear is kind of my. If you are into, uh, if you have not like uh, experienced or like watched like the good Shakespeare stuff, like I highly recommend it. It's like great theater, and I think it uh, the cl the cliche is that it's taught the wrong way. They assign Shakespeare to uh, American students to read them. And not to like perform them and seen see them performed, and I think that's such a disservice because they're plays. They're supposed to be seen. You're supposed to see actors breathe life into the roles. They're not like they're not novels read meant to be read. Um, so I highly recommend. Um, you know the what the good one Macbeth with Ian McKellen, and uh, in the '80s, that's a really good one. Yeah, I, I thought uh, Olivier's Macbeth. Somebody here, um, Kurosawa. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, Macbeth, yeah, that's yeah. I, I Macbeth. I'm sure I've seen it. I can't. Oh, is it? oh with Patrick Stewart. That's great too. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, the, that one was a little bloody for me. I don't know. Like, I, I mean, it was good. Pat, Sir Patrick Stewart's amazing, but um, yeah. Huh. I've not seen these. Uh, they're they're good. They're really good. They're, I saw clips. Um, the Leonardo DiCaprio one. Oh. High school. That, the Baz Luhrmann film that is so horrible. You don't watch that. It's just it is so good. bad. And, and we also, did that, and we watched Taylor Swift's Romeo and Juliet music video. Is what we did in my high school. Wait, there is such a thing. Yeah, she has a song about Rome that says like Romeo and Juliet in it. And so we watched that music video, and then we watched clips of Leonardo DiCaprio. And the, the plot of Romeo and Juliet is so fucking stupid. Like yeah. if they had just <laughs> talked. None of the horrible, whole, like it's such a like a communication breakdown. They were not great communicators. That's the, the, communicated yeah. a little bit. and Juliet, not great communicators. Okay, uh, I, I, to be fair, the Baz Luhrmann one looks amazing. I just, I don't know. I just don't like the. I'm players. not a Baz Luhrmann fan. I'm just, I don't get. I, don't I, I didn't quite vibe with it. It was not. Do, it wasn't for any, me. I'm hmm? curious. Just before we go, I want to make sure that we. We're not shortchanging as we go off on these tangents, and I know I'm responsible most of the time. Um, Emily, do we have any last um, thoughts or questions about this film? Because I think the film is and, if we and said, a great job. And it was just, what? What if we say what we think the number one takeaway for screenwriters is, each of us? Oh, oh that's a good one. Yeah, for Amelie. For, for Amelie. Uh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, I have one. So, if you're going to break the rules, like with a voiceover or very uh, whimsical or stylistic approach, make it connected to who the character is in their journey. 
the narrator in this film is connected to who Amelie is and what she needs to learn. It's not just an arbitrary stylistic thing. So if you're going to do something like flashbacks or, or heavy voiceover or something really stylistic and unique, make it tied to who your protagonist is and what the lesson they need to learn in their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree, like kind of building on that, I guess it's, I think this film does a really good job being internally motivated. Like everything is motivated from within the story. It's not just that like somebody was gonna write a story about this girl and they thought it would be fun to do voiceover. You know, everything is motivated <laughs> from within it. And so that would be my number one takeaway is thinking about how you can like internally motivate the structure, especially if you're gonna break the rules. John. Mine, would, mine would mine would be um, keep your your young creative uh, imaginative spirit, um, and when you find a story that you want to tell, make sure that you have access to that. Make sure you have access to that thing, and then step back from it don't damage it step back from it and know that it's it's going to be necessary to to apply storytelling principles to it um uh but 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 keep keep your you know your rich fertile imagine uh, imagination and creativity um because that's that's what that's what this film you know, really embraces and it's why it's so unique and so special. Um, uh, I, you know, I still, I had to hit pause when she, when she dissolves into a puddle of water. I thought I, 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 it's magic. It's just magic. And so that's what you want to hold on to that and then marry it to the things that, that, that we talk about in here. One more thing is make your mentor like connected to the protagonist. That's something really cool in this film is he he's like her and that he's retreated from the world for different reasons. He's a different person with different problems. He's voyeuristic too, though. He's got his camera and he's looking at, he's the same as her. They have the same bug. Except yeah. he's right. 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 He's not, he made the wrong choices or whatever. He's along on the other path. And he's saying, don't be like me at the end. And I thought that was really good. Yeah. There we go. Right. So free solo about a rock climbing dude, I think. Alexi, is that accurate? Yeah, rock climbing man, yeah. Rock climbing man, and but I think you'll love it. It's a, it's a first our first doc, and, and it's important to look at docs. And, yeah, and it's it's be, to yeah. So uh, if you haven't signed up for our emails, you can find the link in the description. And um, oh, I wanted to share our partnership about with Arc Studio Pro. Yeah. So we recently, like as of like a couple days ago, um, have partnered with Arc Studio Pro, which if you don't know, they make a really, really great screenwriting software. And we're super excited. They were our number one pick for trying to find a way to get you all screenwriting software more affordably. Um, so we're very happy. And we have a 75% off discount code for you if you this would like. Great. Yeah, so if you want to do that, let me, I need to get the link. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I realized that I didn't have the link right here. But we think it's really great, and we're very excited about it. Um, and if you don't have software yet, this could be a good one for you. Yeah, it's also got, like, they have great collaboration tools and, like, outlining tools. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just a screenwriting program. Um, which it could be your, if that's your thing, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh yeah, we're again, they were a number one pick. We wanted to pick someone who was like a newer company who's still like making improvements and like open to like hearing community feedback and putting out good content. And so we were super excited to Yeah, they'll work with you, yeah, with us and with you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we'll see you next week when we do free solo. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.